Okay, I think we're live. This is Journeys in Podcasting, and this is an afternoon session. Today we're going to be talking to Trevor Aleo. If I'm saying your name correctly, you and are. Hopefully, we're going to. Uh, and Angela's sending us several books and one amazing blog, uh, mixing mm. a lot of. Um, I, I like to think of it as the maker-centered uh, learning sensibilities, mixing them into writing spaces, and does okay. many other things too. I hope I got that right. Uh, so, Trevor. I uh, who, who are you? Uh, what do you teach? And um, we'll get into your blog in a second, uh, but maybe you could just introduce yourself first. Sure. Uh, so I teach uh, pre-AP 10, honors, advanced, depending on what moniker you use, uh, and a uh, standard nine uh, English at a public high school in the DC suburbs. Uh, this is my fifth year teaching. Uh, I went to uh, James Madison University. I uh, got my undergrad in English, my master's in education there and have been uh, in the Prince William uh, County School District ever since. Um, I'm at a uh, Center for Performing Arts School, so I deal with a lot of uh, really creative students um, that uh, really take well to some of the uh, more maker-oriented ideas that uh, people like Angela write about. Cool. Well, I'm new to you. I read your blog post, uh, I want to say a couple of weeks ago. The blog post is called Whiteboarding uh, is a Verb making make thinking visible and it resonated all over the place with me and uh, your blog itself i only found three blog posts so i can see that you're kind of just starting and i love how you uh packed in a ton a ton of methodology but you also uh, attach it to uh, theory and research as well and so hopefully we'll unpack some of that over the next hour or so uh, so i'm going to jump right in if any of these questions are out there uh, you know, we don't have to have the answers to everything. I brought along Angela just because she's far more researched uh, <laughs> and, and, and written a lot more uh, on this. And so maybe she can fill in some of the gaps too. Okay, so you wrote in your blog, uh, I participated in an ed chat a few weeks ago around John Warner's phenomenal book, Why They Can't Write. And, and though there was a treasure trove of amazing insight, one idea that really stuck out to me was this. How often are we misdiagnosing students' ability to generate ideas as an inability to write? Uh, I've taught second language learning forever, so this to me just really hits hit strongly. Um, storytelling just seems innately human to me. Everyone is patching together narratives throughout the day, internally co-constructing with peers. It's in our DNA. What are your thoughts of how perhaps schooling is all wrong for the unschooled mind? Uh, well, I, I really like the idea that uh, you're suggesting about how uh, narrative is all around us. Like our lives consist of narratives. Um, we create them, we watch them, we um, share them. I mean, that's what sort of I feel like a, a lot of technology is about is ways to kind of get our story out there, ways to take in other people's stories. So um, I, I think that a lot of times when people, uh, when, it, when it comes to writing, whether you're analyzing a story or telling a story, uh, they don't really see the content of their lives um, as interesting enough to tell a story about. So when I when I have students who do struggle to uh, generate ideas, um, I think that having that conversation about how everything can be a story, um, how everything can sort of steer, share that narrative structure, opens a lot of doors to uh, ideas that were previously sort of closed to them. Um, I do think that narrative is just the way that we kind of construct meaning out of all these sort of disconnected series of events that, that sort of shape who we are and what we do. That's really interesting because today I was working with a group of teachers who were debating whether or not to start the year with narrative. And one of them was suggesting that it's the hardest of the forms. And I was struggling with that a little bit because like you, I see narrative as a beautiful entry point into writing because we're steeped in it all day long, every day. And it's how so many of us make meaning from our own lives and interpret things is through story. And it's also how we communicate too. So yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, whenever I introduce a particular uh, literary concept or, or sort of thematic concept, I want the kids to explore. I always start with uh, sort of prior knowledge entry points. Like, um, you know, when we're talking about power at the beginning of the year, all of my kids had seen the Avengers. They all know who Thanos is. Um, so like, let's let's dig into that. Um, you know, when we, we think that kids can't access these ideas or that narrative structure is hard, how many hours of Netflix, you know, do your students spend watching? Or how many hours of a Snapchat story, Instagram story? Um, I, I think that the idea of narrative is pretty intuitive, but it does require a reframing of what we view narrative as. 
That's a really good point. Did I say that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is a, when I was reading your blog, I was kind of thinking the same thing. I was like, wow, this is the theme I've been on lately, this idea of technology and narrative as a technology. Narrative is information packer, like one of our, our uh, most efficient ways to get a lot of information off uh, and how our learning uh, should parallel and be a lot like narrative creation, even beginning a new unit, onboarding into a story. You know, uh, what are the issues? What are the problems here? Like, what are we throwing out there for kids to kind of create their um, narrative? Which I, you mentioned later in your blog. I think we'll come back to that same thing. You also talk a lot about this idea of divergent, convergent thinking. And anyone who's looked at uh, design thinking, for example, knows the double diamond. And there's times that it's time to be convergent. And even if you're not talking about necessarily a, an empathy design, using these methods and having kids recognize when it's time to let the mind run wild and when it's OK. And you, you mentioned this a couple of times in your blog of um, when I want kids to take a lot of chances and get all their ideas out and, and feel kind of feel safe there. And then when it's time to be convergent. So you wrote opening divergent, um, rewrite the question at the top of your whiteboard. Reread it aloud word by word. These are instructions to the students, I'm assuming. Write down any idea that comes to mind on individual post-it notes. They can be concrete details, inferences, personal connections, anything. Quantity over quality. The more ideas, the merrier. So I immediately was shaking, you know, nodding my head and like, damn, that's good. Teaching the students, <laughs> students to validate their own thoughts, to create malleable, rearrangeable artifacts and bits and pieces on this non-threading medium of whiteboards. They're erasable and post-its. You mess one up, you just start again. Not to mention the fact that you're writing and usually a bold marker. Uh, and so it, even that tool communicates. Celebrating the messiness of thinking, um, not to mention the collective construction, the dispersed teaching and learning that goes on when you're creating artifacts like this, and the power of making our thinking visible before a learning community. I also see from the images uh, that you posted on Twitter and in your blog, this takes uh, a whole new added playful element by taking over different classroom surfaces. Your desks become whiteboards, uh, the tables. And I wonder if you might walk us through the moment when you realized, whoa, this is really, like, this really works. You know, how does leaving the class with an artifact, an immediate sense of accomplishment, change everything? Um, so I, I've always uh, enjoyed conversation and dialogue uh, within my class, whether that's uh, on a, just a peer-to-peer -peer level, um, from students to student, within a group, as a class. Um, and I was, I'm always looking for ways, and I was always looking for ways to make those conversations easier. Um, and uh, what really drew me to being an English teacher was like having an opportunity to talk about um, those deep, you know, uh, sort of underlying patterns to the human experience. Um, but conversations about those things are messy, they're abstract, they're hard. Um, and kids, especially my student population, is terrified of failure. Um, they're terrified of generating their own ideas because they might be wrong. Um, they're used to receiving ideas from their teacher, regurgitating those ideas back out onto a worksheet, and then you know being like, I, I was right because I repeated what I heard. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it takes some time to get them being comfortable generating ideas because whether it is a, you know your AP honor student that is terrified of being wrong and getting a low grade, or your um, you know, struggling students who is afraid of being wrong and continuing to feel like the narrative of them not being smart or not being successful continues because they're wrong again. Um, regardless, there's just a, a giant fear of being wrong. So uh, I think the importance of uh, sort of being vulnerable um, at the beginning of those conversations to just be willing to throw ideas out there um, kind of, uh, I guess opens the floodgates, like I said in my blog, for people to be willing to have those deeper conversations. Um, but even when I, I had my students who were comfortable being wrong, I felt like they're, they're, and I've talked about this in my blog as well, they were hitting cognitive load. Their brains were short circuiting. Uh, the analogy that I use is they're opening up a thousand browser tabs on one you know, Internet Explorer pane. And by taking those ideas and putting them onto a desk, they're opening, uh, they're doing their, I call it their, our brains extend display feature. Um, so instead of, you know, crashing your, your desktop or, or making this big messy, you know, series of browser tabs, they're taking their ideas and they're putting them on the desk. They're opening it into a new space. And it, it, like you said, it, it makes them malleable, it makes them reframable, and it, they're comfortable being vulnerable 
because instead of having to stare at what they did wrong, scratch it out, they literally just crumple it up and throw it away and then start writing to the next thing. So uh, kind of, hopefully this isn't too <laughs> rambly. It's, uh, it's the union of what I, what I want my students to discuss and be comfortable discussing um, and the, the method of that sort of maker inspired writing. They, ju they just went hand in hand. So um, it, it was sort of the secret sauce that I was missing to have my, let my students have those conversations that I, I just always wanted them to have. You know, I, I talk more about documentation later on, but I, I kind of want you to know, like uh, in this process, how did you come across all this? Um, I mean, these are so many things that um, I've been trying to kind of squeeze into the same space as well. And is this something you learned in teacher training? Is this something you just picked up on the side? Is there a clear, um, I used to think, now I think moment? Uh, do you have documentation of like what students produced like before, what they produce like now? What, what has this kind of process been like, been for you? Um, you know, I am just sort of a overzealous amateur um, who uh, I, I'm a, a ma an intellectual magpie. Like I, I have, I, I see an idea that I find interesting. Um, I, I see what other uh, ideas are being developed about it, what iterations there are of it, and I just kind of see how it could work in my class. So when it came to the whole like maker inspired writing, um, I was lucky enough to go to the business innovation um, factories annual summit last year. Um, and that's where I saw Dave Gray. Um, and he talked about the importance of like writing and doodling um, and how you can kind of, like I said before, use that extend uh, display feature of our brain by putting things down on the page. Um, and it just sort of intuitively made sense to me that that would make those conversations that I wanted easier. Um, it's only having, you know, just said, I'm gonna try this and see what happens. I feel like uh, I, I try it because intuitively I think it'll make sense. And then it's funny because I'll go back and I'll, I'll find all this research. And based on that research, I can sort of hone and reframe and um, improve uh, you know, that initial intuition that I kind of had. Um, so uh, it's people like um, uh, Angela's work. Uh, she's another person who I follow who sort of gave me more ideas about how I can keep taking that, you know, sticky note whiteboarding ideas um, and looking at them from education, uh, building on or reframing what Dave Gray did in the innovation space for education. Um, a lot of the the ideas in terms of the content, what kids are writing comes from a lot of the concept-based learning stuff I've been exploring, um, concept-based literacy, uh, literacy um, and concept-based curriculum have kind of like given me, that's the, the content that I paired with the methodology that they both kind of work together in unison. I, I think we can't understate the influence that Dave Gray and SUNY Brown and James McAnufo probably have on this thinking. Um, their book, Game Storming, was a big game changer for me. I was doing a lot of research, action research at the time, and noticing connections between making and writing in the spaces that I was working in, in schools and in my writing studio. Um, but at the time, it was heavily in what I was focusing on most was loose parts play. And it was heavily inspired by what I was learning um, from reading about Reggio Emilia. And that was long before I visited. But then when I, you know, I, I came to game storming because I was looking for better ways to facilitate adult learning. And I started reading and looking at the knowledge work and the games that they were sharing um, in that book. And it changed everything because now it's not just about loose parts play. Now making writing is also about treating text and ideas and knowledge as loose parts. And their structure of the game where it just spoke to me because I, I just had this sense that I was rushing kids to convergent thinking spaces way too fast. They had these amazing ideas. And because I was so concerned with controlling for quality inside of my classroom, which is what they talk about in game storming, this, this tension between controlling for quality and controlling for creativity. And yes, you can control for creativity. And that's what these approaches allow you to do. Um, because I was so concerned with controlling for quality, I wasn't embracing divergent thinking and I wasn't and I didn't have a framework for emergent thinking either. And that's really what I think game storming gave me. And that's the connection, you know, that I think I was able to make with Trevor, too, and how I might have influenced that work. But it really does go back to Dave and Suni and James, that piece of it anyway. Um, so I was doing all this work with loose parts play. 
inside of my writing studios. And then all of a sudden you stumble upon these protocols and it's like, that's loose parts play too. Only the parts are sticky notes and index cards. And that was a whole new world. Yeah, so one thing hearing you now and also picking it up from your blog was this idea of paralleling with the technologies that students are using. I'm talking about their digital technologies. So you were talking about using the, the metaphors of the tabs and the cognitive load of having too many tabs open. Um, and I, I, I've approached that same kind of thing of like trying to use our technological tools as we teach the manipulative parts within the classroom. So for example, a student puts up their writing and we teach what a meaningful uh, conversation is or comment section is on the Google Doc. So we physically make the Google Doc on the wall and then when we go back in the digital spaces, kids aren't just playing and chatting in there, but these are actually like serious things that they have to you know, give critique of the student work with and stuff. I think that's amazing. And the other side of this technology piece is just um, stretching that whole idea of technology. That if you look at like an activity theory, tool is anything. It's the marker in your hand, it's the whiteboard, it's the desktops, but it's also the thinking moves. It's also the language you use it's this, the human interactions with that space, all of those things become technologies in kind of a Vygotsky sense of, you know, zone of proximal development, which is not just next step learning, it's what are you using within your learning space that's going to extend your leverage in that learning. So on this idea of divergent convergent, but also this idea of uh, the collective, I've always taught younger kids. And so a lot of the, the uses I've had for these kind of design thinking methods is um, approaching it as a class, you know, affinity grouping ideas, maybe because not all the students are even generating the ideas, but when we do it as a group, then all of a sudden everybody starts kicking in and participating to kind of get things, um, get things moving. So you write here uh, that you give your kids um, a lot of prompted uh, parts of it or parameters around the work. You write, if you're stuck, consider these potential idea containers for your categories. Um, universal concepts, power, control, truth, love, hate, order, chaos, library elements like plot setting, characters, theme, conflict, tone, chronology. When did each event occur? Can you make a timeline, internal, external? Is what's happening internal, external in nature, cause, effect? Which ideas lead to something else? Which, which are in an end result? Uh, in developing student content, uh, confidence in your affinity grouping stages, how do you feel about teacher co-constructions here? Like when do you also become co-constructor with them? Uh, and when perhaps to step in and set parameters and when you feel like kids are ready to, to run it on their own? What, what's your experience been there? So uh, I do teach uh, a, an honors 10 class and they're, they're a pretty quick intuitive group, but I was pretty surprised at how quickly um, they took to the idea of finding those emergent patterns and coming up with their own sort of idea containers. Um, that was something as I was going around, I was expecting to have to scaffold more, provide more examples. Um, and I, I provided a framework that they could use um, because for the example that I, I shared in my blog, uh, we had talked about the six sources of civic power, um, which are basically how do people have power in the civic space? And I said, these are potential idea containers um, that you can kind of consider uh, as you were, you picked your movie, what, what sort of different types of power are important or influential. Um, and some of them, like, like you saw my examples went with that, but others came up with their own ideas. And it was, it was powerful, I think for them, um, you know, once they go over the hump of generating the ideas, seeing all the different ways that, uh, that uh, they can structure and sequence uh, those individual blocks of ideas. And uh, a lot of times what I struggle with, with my, with my students when it comes to their, their academic writing is, seeing how you can structure and sequence, you know, uh, essays or, or writing on, on a more macro level. So I think it, it, it helped them sort of see that, you know, once you generate these ideas, it's just as important to consider, well, how do they all fit together as well? Um, and giving them that kind of safe space to practice and experiment with that um, was em empowering and exciting, especially considering they were just doing a movie that they were familiar with and knew intimately. They weren't, you know, worried about remembering the correct details or characters' names. It was something that they could really focus on the process, really focus on their patterns. Uh, obviously, I had them apply it to their uh, more academic text later, but I, I was happy with the idea of letting them experiment with that uh, emergent pattern phase uh, with something they were really comfortable with. 
So is this all done individually? Are kids, uh, like what is the social construct in there? Do they work as a collective or is it all mm -hmm. everyone working at their desk and then just kind of getting ideas from your partner? How do you manage that part, in, especially in a school system that is you know, ever pressuring kind of the individualized measurement of learning? Uh, how do you take advantage of that kind of cooperative goal? Yeah, so it is, it's always, uh it's always collaborative. Um, I, I guess when we do some of our essay planning, it can be done on an individual level, but typically I, I do it at a collaborative level. Uh, my desks are set up in groups. Um, realizing that uh, when I first got to the school, the tables for whiteboards was, was a godsend. Um, it was, I was mind blown at how powerful of a tool uh, that was. Um, and so it, because it's collaborative, I think they, it's a, it's a, a joint effort. Um, they feel comfortable sort of sharing ideas that they might not otherwise, because, you know, instead of it, them sharing an idea and it comes immediately to me, they have that sort of barrier as a group and they could be like, oh, well, let's reframe this idea or repurpose this idea. Or, I don't know if that works um, because they're comfortable with each other. Um, I think they're more willing to be vulnerable take, you know, swing for the fences when they go for those ideas and those groupings. Um, so I definitely think that collaborative piece is, is incredibly important. Um, I don't usually don't have them do much um, individually before I have them try it collaboratively first um, when it comes to introducing them to process oriented things. Angela, you've had more maker ed experience and, and some Reg Amelia background as well. What about you or Reg Amelia, like the learning community is such a strong part of the, of the philosophy and the method. Um, it is. Um, what's really interesting is I think that we tend to create community through slightly more artificial constructs in our country. Um, when I'm immersed in community there, it seems to be a language that they speak in a way that they engage with one another from the outset. And so um, I've never seen the deliberate construction necessarily of, of groups and roles and rules and parameters, the way kind of that we set them here. Although there's much tension in the design of the groups as they're established. And there are reasons why teachers will work with students together um, or put them together in certain learning contexts. Uh, but it's just a very different feel there than it is when I'm looking at how we orchestrate collaborative learning experiences here at home. Uh, it's it's funny thinking about that. Uh, you know, just America's, you know, we we are a country that for, you know, good or ill is driven by the individual. And it's almost like by creating roles, we still are like, we will, we have to acknowledge you as an individual, but you are in this collective, right? You can't just be the collective. Yeah. You always have to have your individual role. And I think there's sometimes that can create um, limit. Yeah, there's this inherent trust that teachers, it, it's a big part of how they define their relationships with children in Reggio Amelia, that they trust their children. They trust children to make their own choices and their own decisions. And they trust that um, all learning is social. And it, it's a big you know, um, piece of conversation every time that you go there. And um, so they don't, I feel that perhaps it's possible that they don't feel that they need to orchestrate collaborative learning because they feel that it is an organic thing, that if we just step out of the way, it's going to happen. And our job is to put kids in a situation where learning can be social and then to watch what they do and follow them and learn from them what we're supposed to do as teachers. It's, it's a completely different process. It's funny to hear you say learn from them because as I've been going around and looking at the organizational patterns my students come up with, um, some of the examples I shared um, with how they use sticky notes and uh, expo markers to structure their essay. Um, you know, I had a student who was like, I created like a Tetris structure and my quotes and evidence fit together within this geometric and shape. And I'm like, you did what? How? Yeah. And you know, and it's this sort of thing where, you know, when we are comfortable relinquishing control, I think that a lot of problems when it comes to education is not, not actual control, but just the perception of yeah. control. Um, I think this that that causes a lot of problems. It's not, you know, it's it, for me, I'm still a control freak, but I'm finding that I get more satisfaction as a control freak 
by learning from my kids um, <laughs> rather than pretending, you know, to steer the ship. I, I So, you know, I, I love to talk about that whole notion of control and we talk about it a lot in the field of education and it's something that we kind of throw around a lot is this assumption that all teachers are control freaks and we just need to let go of control. Well, I don't know that all of them are, first of all. And then second of all, even if we are, maybe a better way of thinking about it is, is if it, you're trying to control anything, how do you get that control? Like, how, what, what is, I think we really need to be dealing with reality if we want control, right? And reality is best defined, I think it's better defined when we are positioning ourselves as learners and letting our students teach us some things rather than assuming that we're teaching them anything, I guess, is kind of where I come from. My own documentation that worked this year, my commitment this year is to document the unexpected because I'm learning so much more that way and it's so much more satisfying. I still feel like I'm kind of a control freak though, but <laughs> I'm getting better answers this way. I don't know. So let's talk a little bit about in that uh, learning from the students and tinkering with this malleable thing we call a learning space. You know, it, it, it sounds like you're, you've got the right idea of like trying out a few methods, seeing the response from students, see what they do with it. Uh, in your blog, you write, asking students to weave that conceptual knowledge together is easier said than done. In order to make those conceptual relationship statements, they must not only understand the concept on its own, but also the relationship it has with other concepts. We've explored that unit. That Back to this idea of creating the essay of, of process and product as a construct. Once you put those visible pieces in there from the beginning so that the work is always there, we can always kind of stop, point, look, and the two of us can kind of meet out what that thing means. If one of us gets kind of lost in conversation, we can avoid that circular conversation thing because it's all right there in front of us. How, how has that been for you? For me, that was a huge, big game changer of teaching with artifact, especially student constructed artifact. Um, what has been the process been like for you? So uh, which, which process exactly? Sorry, I keep turning my mic off to avoid this flickering image. Um, the process of like, I assume that at one point you didn't teach with post-its and whiteboards. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then at one point you decided that you were gonna try out some of these game storing methods of getting our thought out as visible, tangible pieces there in front of us. Um, was that any kind of like big change or, or what did you notice there? It was, so I, I think that the reason um, I was drawn to uh, the, the whole game, uh, game storming style was it it was a method that aligned really well with my instructional goals which have been changed over the course of this year as i've started looking at more concept-based teaching um and uh for me it, it's sort of an addition to what i think my job is as as an english teacher um, i think that we're all aware of the fact that we need to explore what i call like the the shakespearean how which is how do how do authors and creators use language what tools, devices, uh, et cetera, do they use to tell stories? We need to understand that, then we need to use it and practice it ourselves. Um, and I think that, you know, and with all the extra uh, research coming out now about the importance of background knowledge for literacy, um, I am also wanting to explore what I call the, the Socratic why. So these are those deep underlying patterns to our experiences um, that you, we can organize content around, whether that be the process oriented, you know, ELA content, or it be, it's like, you know, just events in a text that you can organize around those concepts. Um, so going back to my point earlier, this idea of them having to work with these sort of uh, foggy abstractions. Um, and I was looking for a way that, you know, they could have those conversations and look at, you know, how does, what is the relationship between order and chaos? You know, verbally articulating that is incredibly difficult, um, but when you can create it visually, it's a, it's a, it makes it a lot more accessible. Um, so sort of there are a lot of ideas that I think we might perceive as being too uh, intellectually rigorous or challenging for, for students to engage in when it comes to like understanding the deeper meaning behind uh, literature. Um, but you know, right now uh, with my freshmen, you know, the, this is not my you know, advanced AP whatever students, um, we're looking at the relationship between love, hate, loyalty, and identity. Uh, and we're acting out scenes from Romeo and Juliet, and we're reading a sequence of book club books uh, like The Hate You Give, The Fault in Our Stars, um, Son of the Mob. And the the insight that the kids have had about these deeply 
profound human experiences that we have has been mind blowing. Um, the, the, the level of conversation they can have when they can take these concept ideas, they can illustrate their understanding visually or through metaphor. Um, and uh, using sticky notes, using the extra markers, plotting those relationships between those concepts and just having a conversation about it. Um, it it's, it's, it's almost like a, a conversational crutch that lets kids have those deep, profound conversations that we don't think that they have the ability to have um, because they can sort of uh, get a foothold by visually capturing the relationship between those ideas. So when a lot of people look at uh, game storming like, like activities and, and they just see post-its everywhere and they see this high level of engagement, motivation, and that, you know, I've had ad admin or directors try to repeat this without fully understanding that this is only one step in an iterative process along the way, that yes, you can fill up the room with post-its and we can all have an amazing time, but then if we don't revisit those and construct off of them later, then all of that energy has just gone nowhere. And this I see, as you say in your blog, you say, um, these were more exploratory than final, but allowing students to start discussing and articulating these conceptual relationships help them realize how all of our activities and corresponding concepts fit together like puzzle pieces. As the unit continues, they'll have chances to return to their concept maps, tweak them, and eventually communicate the generalizations in a series of three to five written statements. Yeah, this makes total sense to me. Like you have this fail safe iterative process in their writing where students may fudge it up one day, but they can come back around and fix it up the next time. Um, you know, it's the, um, it's the yeah. tinkering in the middle of it too. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about having the kids sort of broadcast their ideas, their initial ideas or the evidence they've gathered even or facts, across all of these sticky notes, the reason why we put them on sticky notes is to move them around. And when we mix and remix those micro bits of, of information and ideas and we bump them together, new ideas form. Even when we're doing affinity mapping with those sticky notes, kids have the ability to lift notes and put them into other groups temporarily and consider how that changes the theory that they might come up with. So this whole notion of using the sticky notes or index cards or any sort of small scrap of paper and breaking those ideas into really small parts and unmaking the whole and then mixing and remixing it, that emergent process, for me, that's what's super powerful too. So how do you manage the logistics of this? You know, I, I know that early Lucy Calkins were talking like before the units of study and the kids would actually cut up their paper into like different writing parts and then try out different methods. And so there wasn't this idea that once you write it on the page, it's set in stone and you can't really change it. It was more like on purpose, we're gonna write it, then we're gonna like disperse it, then we're gonna like make it all malleable uh, and then put it back together. Uh, from class to class, how do you manage that when it's a whiteboard on your table and when it's sticky notes on your table? How do you revisit that? I know this is something very logistical and maybe very simple, but I know that's also something teachers struggle with. No, that's it's a great question. And I'm still kind of figuring out uh, the best way to do that. As, as of right now, I just snap a picture. Um, that's why I've had so many uh, what turned into great student artifacts is I snap a picture and then we go back to our next thing, uh, our next activity with it. Uh, we use Edmodo as sort of our like online classroom space. Um, I am able to share the, the image with the kids and then they can kind of jump back into where they were. Um, and as I introduce them to more concepts um, throughout the course of the unit and the course of the year, um, they're then able to introduce those and in, in speaking to Angela's point, they then can refine and remix that original conceptual relationship. So it's like they have this new sticky note um, that is also a new idea. And, you know, by introducing that into their prior framework, well, they have to, to shift and change that framework. They have to remix that idea to account for how that new concept works within that, um, that sort of overarching framework. Um, so it's, it's, it was crazy to me just how introducing instead of it just being introducing a new idea that they have to remix and understand, by taking that idea and putting it on a sticky note, I, I was really surprised how much more, how much more they took to just doing that. It wasn't this, you know, sort of sit and debate, you know, how do we introduce this new concept or idea? They put it on a sticky note, they put it here, well, now we got to change the framework. They erase what they had on the whiteboard and, it, and then they're off to the races. It just makes them so much more willing to experiment, to admit that they need to update or that they were wrong or that they need to look at new information. So just 
bringing that idea into the physical space, I think makes a big difference. Oh, sorry, I thought Angel was going to say something. Um, so what about this idea of um, the cognitive load theory, which I, I read through where you linked in there, and then strangely, to me, one of the best explanations for this was the Wikipedia page for it. So uh, I found that had some incredible examples. I was most impressed towards the end where it talks about the bridging now of cognitive load theory with grounded cognition and, and uh, embodied cognition. So that's uh, incorporating more modalities uh, into the, cog you know, considering cognitive load, uh, the body gesture, uh, different ways of communicating or getting your ideas across than just with language. I found that completely fascinating. How has this idea um, affected your teaching, I guess I want to ask? Uh, you know, cognitive load is a very hard thing to communicate. Uh, I, I love how the theory, like, differentiates extrinsic, extrinsic, germane, you know, your, your schema, uh, and then kind of like different levels you can actually like increase here and decrease there. How, um, how much have you geeked out on that? Like how far do you take that theory when, when planning a, a learning design? Um, I, I am by no means uh, like a, a super uh, well-researched, knowledgeable source of uh, cognitive load. Um, I, like you said, it, it has very been a very exploratory sort of um, process for me as I, as I understand it and figure out how I can incorporate it. I think the biggest change for me, and this is something that Angela can speak to uh, uh, with a lot more granularity, is just the idea of being flexible with the medium that we allow kids to present their understanding. Um, writing is great, uh, text is great, but there are other ways that kids can convey meaning and understanding. Um, so currently when, for my Julius Caesar unit, uh, going back to what you were saying about like the, that physical uh, way to convey meaning or to um, share knowledge. Um, my kids are doing, uh, acting out the murder of Julius Caesar and uh, they have to pick a hero and a villain um, because the way that we're looking at our articles of the week and current events is a lot of times the news creates he hero villain narratives. So they have to see how would you communicate that hero villain narrative through gesture in a play. So, um, you know, instead of having them write all the, the complex nuanced ways that, you know, Shakespeare, um, has his actors convey that meaning they're actually doing it themselves. They're considering like well, by moving my arm this way or by positioning this character on this part of the stage, um, how can I convey my understanding of who I believe the hero to be, who I believe the villain to be? Um, and additionally, they're, they're applying their knowledge of the, the dramatic conventions, which is you know one of our, our standards. Um, so I, I think that the flexibility of medium in terms of how kids communicate and convey meaning is really important. And I, I think that that's, that's a, lot, a lot of what uh, Angela does as well. Yeah. I also, in my own work, when I'm supporting teachers on the ground, we speak a lot um, about being able to differentiate our learning targets and teaching points a little bit as well. Um, we always want to teach in a micro way, mini lessons, things that kids can be able to tinker and, you know, with and apply in their own writing and their own making and work in a single session. And I think our sensitivity to cognitive load helps us decide how we might offer them differentiated invitations or how they might help to us, us to create them themselves. If we know what our learning target or teaching point is um, and we hold it close, we can kind of follow the kids. And so, you know, the cognitive load of any task is going to, uh, I, I think, hit different kids in different ways. You know, it's all very much a personalized sort of thing in my world. At least that's how my interpretation of it is working. And um, we need to be able to have some clarity around what we're hoping to accomplish with them in terms of teaching point or learning target. And then if we are real certain about what that is, we can allow them to translate in a thousand different ways. Yeah, I, I come into it through a little bit different portal. I guess I, I started more with like Gardner's art, mind and brain and just looking mm -hmm. how kids use um, drawing, for example, for very different purposes. One kid might draw and the drawing has a very distinct linear kind of narrative to it where another, another kid might create a graphic which becomes the backdrop, a very kind of symbolic form for right. the stage, so to speak, setting the stage for where the story will take place. Um, I think the other side I've seen of this is more, 
I think of it, I don't know a whole lot about universal design learning, but from what I've read, it's like trying to create learning environments where, you know, everyone has a low entrance. The threshold to enter is very low. So, for example, Shakespeare through text is going to be a pretty high entrance. Yeah. You know, your language abilities have to be quite high. For some, to it, might be a, it might be a more, you know, for some it might be. But for others who are comfortable there, that might be where they want to enter. Yeah. So to get at that and to make it a constructivist space, that there's a construct in there for everybody to work on. Uh, I'm listening to this idea of you know, using uh, theatrics. And so Augusto Boal, Theater of the Oppressed, you know, their methods are very in tune to um, teaching where maybe there's not a high level of text literacy in the environment, but you still want to get these really high critical thinking skills. So uh, looking at like improv theater to teach Shakespeare, for example, where you might use image theater, use gesture, you know, okay, well, what does this scene look like? Can you create a freeze frame for it? And kids might get up and do the dramatic scene. And then while they're frozen, we all sit and talk about, you know, so kind of a de-mechanizes the body and the body becomes an expressive tool within yeah. the learning space as well. Um, so that I'm fascinated by, this idea of front, not, not precognitive, because that's kind of like predicting the future, but I guess front-loading cognition of if kids are going to write, uh, getting as much thinking in their head as possible across any medium necessary. So that might include drawing, it might include acting, it might include role play. Then when they go to write the thing or get their ideas out, there's so many ideas going in their head. And this has been my strategy working with younger kids is um, get them so riled up with idea that and, and it's defined like what they want to say. So when they move to, to the writing table, it just starts pouring out. I mean, that's one one strategy. I guess the yes. other. Yeah. So, so, so to that point, um, I, I start my units with what I call like a call to adventure, where the kids do some sort of uh, role play or some sort of activity that gets them thinking about the deeper ideas and concepts we're going to do. So before we started the Lord of the Flies, we did this simulation um, where every group had on their desk a uh, an envelope with. Uh, resources that were just pieces of paper, paper clips, whatever. And I put on the board that um, in order to win the game, I had a big bag of candy I was going to give them, um, they had to have uh, X number of resources by the time the timer was up. And I said, the only rule is there are no rules. So no group had the same resources, no group had it. Well, one group had a glut of resources, all the others were missing a few. Um, and, you know, I said, there, there are no rules. So, you know, at first they try to engage in trade, they're trying to have conversation. And then inevitably there's, there's one kid who just goes over and steals something. And then the whole class is like, whoa, like, that's not cool. And then inevitably I'm like, there, there are no rules. And then they, they just could decline into chaos. Um, and to your point about uh, front loading, you know, the, the, that cognition, that, that idea of chaos, order, control, power, it's, it's sort of revealed through that learning experience. And it, it doesn't take more than you know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, but you know, my students frequently say like, that was the favorite, my favorite activity we did all year because from that, you know, those concepts that we talked about, I kept applying and reapplying as we kept reading new texts because th those idea of, of people trying to work together, failing, or people trying to you know, uh, take or assert power is something that's so central to all the stories that we read. Um, that like it, it is like you said such a low barrier to entry. Remember that time where we played the game and everybody was basically fighting over nothing, um, and it, it it makes a big difference. Um, and I have other others that I do for um, other texts, but that's the one that I think really sticks out in terms of front loading those more complex ideas. Yeah, I, it's funny. I was, I was talking about something kind of very similar where there's a fourth grade class and they're about to study about World War II, and I was like, well, that's just a massive complex web of things like what are they possibly going to walk away with i said why don't you start with um an immersion and then have the immersion be the frame and it also becomes the transference so to speak so uh kind of like what you're talking about where you create a role play you pick your content pieces and you pick them so carefully and i'm thinking more here like a kind of grant wiggins uh style of like knowing your content so well that you kind of know what the thinking will most likely be. You're playing with probabilities, and then you pick out your combinations of things, and once there's two artifacts, it's more likely that they're gonna gravitate towards it this way, and then once there's three, well, then you pretty much are playing the same like 
Soviet poster propaganda where you, you know, you make a photo montage so that the mind is just kind of jump from figure to figure and it's going to come up with this kind of assumption. So we kind of play the same games with kids a little bit where the immersion activity potentially for this World War II study for fourth graders is something like a tweet from um, AOC, from Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, where uh, we might delve into this tweet and why it's so controversial and why people are trying to get her to shut up. And then that becomes sort of like our discussion point about censorship, about freedom of speech. And then as we go into the World War II study, that's one of the mechanisms which we have at our grasp to uh, tackle the content. It's not the only one, it's not the only factor, but that's one of the ways we're gonna think about it. And then at the end, after the study is done, that also can kind of become your transference. Oh, well, this is why we study history so we don't repeat things like this. And this is one case where, look, things are starting to bubble up in this one area that start kind of reminiscent of former eras of censorship, so to speak. So that your, your immersion becomes your transference at the end is what I'm, I mean, there's also a lot of uh, project-based learning design is kind of based on this, where you create this immersive experience, you have you know, student-driven as much as possible, the, the action statement or the defined problem that you're going to solve, and then everything that you study in the meantime is gonna kind of tie into that. I'm kind of rambling here just on ideas, but is that kind of what you're getting at with your Lord of the Flies example? Uh, yeah, yeah, um, and I like that because the, the deepest form of learning is when you can transfer that sort of generalized conceptual understanding from one context to another. So when you are providing them with a bunch of contexts and, and always having some sort of real world application, they're seeing how these ideas play out across these contexts, and then they can begin applying it to their, their, their lives as well. So um, I, I, I really like the idea of starting that initial conversation being that real world context um, as sort of like a provocation to discuss, and then you jump into your text, but then at the end, bringing it back. And be like what, and what new, or, new, more nuanced understanding do we have of that initial conversation, um, of that initial provocation. Uh, I, I think that's that's a really cool way of having them transfer their learning, but then see how much they have learned because they can have a conversation about those ideas, you know, censorship, um, et cetera, but how much deeper of understanding will they have of it once they've also read 1984 and they've transferred that initial understanding to that other context that's much more complex and they've honed and refined their understanding of those ideas and then bringing that back to that initial provocation, I think is really interesting perspective in your environment there um public school uh, how do you feel constrained how do you feel liberated like what are your kind of um like if you could redesign the environment would you make it more open i mean do you feel like there's freedom to try all these things out uh where do you feel pushback on that um so i i'm lucky in that i'm, I'm granted a, a pretty good amount of autonomy within my district within my school and within my classroom um, I, I think my biggest struggle is more some of the um, internalized systemic pressures that my kids have. Um, they are great obsessed. They are great hungry. Um, and, you know, I, I, can't, I, can't, I, I can't really blame them because the system in which they are learning tells them that everything that they must learn must be measured. And when I'm trying to teach them things that are, are messy and complicated, it's difficult to measure. Plus, there's not really a a point in measuring, you know, there's a point in providing feedback, there's not a point in measuring this messy, abstract, unquantifiable thing. Um, so the beginning of the year, uh, they're, they're frustrated with me. So I tell them, I'm going to light you on fire, I'm going to put you on a bike, and I'm going to push you down a hill, because this linear input-output model of uh, you're right, you're wrong, change this answer, like that that goes away. Um, that crutch is gone. Um, so it's not really that there are, are real uh, hard firm barriers that prevent me from doing what I would like to do or getting kids to, to understand, like to understand as much as there are a lot of internalized ways that they approach and view school that I have to kind of deprogram them from, but also be sensitive to the fact that, um, you know, they still exist within that system. And when they leave my class, you know, that that might not be the, the, the ideas that their parents have or their other teachers have or or whatever. So it, it's, it's always a challenge getting them to trust me that, you know, the grade will work itself out um, and just to focus on that process. Um, yeah, I come out of a lot more project design, design for elementary, where it's a lot easier to trick the kids into thinking that the performance you're about to give is way more important than any grade or report card. You know, they get much more uh, jazzed about their learning, about this product that they're gonna create. 
Um, and so I'm not sure how well that would communicate as you go up in the middle high school when kids are kind of on to the school game and, you know, know mm -hmm. that like, okay, well, I, I need all of these things. So uh, how successful do you feel like you're tweaking that once you change the product of learning when the real currency within this banking schooling system is the grade? Uh, do you think you're able to uh, distract kids enough so that they, you know, kind of value this other thing more? It's a great question. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I try really hard. I, I bend so much of my will to get them to do that. And I think that there are moments of, there are moments where the, the grade disappears. Uh, there are moments where the content takes over. Um, I think a lot of times, even if they're really enjoying and engaging what they're doing, it's still there. But like uh, I had my students do a podcast where they had to discuss uh, the intersection of uh, the Lord of the Flies, a book club book that they read about um, it, several selections, but all of them sort of dealt with like uh, refugees and uh, some uh, some nonfiction research they did. And when they were in that podcast studio, the gray disappeared for a little while. Um, they just were able to have a really cool conversation. And they came back with just really big smiles on their faces. When we do Socratic seminar, um, the, the grade kind of disappears and the conversation just sort of takes on its own life. Um, so I, I guess it's when it's in an environment where the kids are able to sort of have power, control, and autonomy over what they're doing. Um, and it doesn't remind them of what they usually do in school. Um, there's not the, the, the paper in front of them and the pencil there and the, you know, the teacher walking around while the clock ticks, you know, quietly in the background. It's, it's school looks different. And because what we're doing is so different than what they're used to, they can sort of um, escape, I guess, their usual frame for what they view, what they do in school, which is compete for grades. Angela, is this all complete like BS or uh, like how, how are we doing on this thing? No. <laughs> I, was, I was nodding before because um, what I really appreciated was this was one of the, it was really refreshing actually. Trevor is one of the first teachers who um, followed his statement about kids being obsessed with grades with ownership of the fact that we created this monster. So I, I work with a lot of people who get really frustrated over the fact that kids won't do it. You know, we have to dangle the carrot and the stick. And why are they like that? Well, no wonder they're like that. And I, I appreciated that that he was being so, you know, honest and uh, understanding and I'm empathetic about that because um, we created that in kids. And especially by the time they're in high school, oh my gosh, like that's even, kids are behaving this way when they're in second and third and fourth grade already by the time they're in high school. You know, that that machine has been uh, running for a very long time. So I appreciated that. But I do a lot of work with standards based report card design inside of schools because it allows teachers uh, to move away from using grades and to move closer to a place where we're relying more on feedback and an honest assessment of progress towards standards. And I, I feel like that is work that I truly enjoy. It's some of the people don't know that I spend a lot of time doing that because of the make writing stuff. But uh, I feel that that's even more important work that I do inside of the field. And and that's um, that's where the money is right now if we're gonna make any progress with these kids as far as I'm concerned, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that standards-based piece is really important. That's something that we've pivoted to in recent years. And um, my kids are able to rewrite a paper pretty much any time. Um, you know, I have to you know, keep within the, the confines of the quarters because that's when our grades get pulled. But um, besides that, my kids have a giant window. They can make appointment, they can come in, they can rewrite. And I think that if we are going to break them of that internalized narrative about, it's all about the grade, um, we need to give them an opportunity to show their learning, to get the grade. They can get the grade that, that they'd like and that will set them up for success. But um, if their, their first go at it isn't perfect, that's fine. And especially in uh, something as, process oriented and going back and, and sort of rechecking what our, our thinking and our execution is writing. Um, I, I think the idea of there just being a one-off turn it in and done writing is, that's just not how any other form of writing is done outside of the classroom. Yeah, I think when we can shift to a place too, like in my own work with teachers, we're assessing target by target and bit by bit now and documenting learning that way. So 
we're offering feedback that way and we're prompting revision that way. And so the draft is being elevated as it's built one little bit at a time. We're collecting that kind of evidence as we move through the process. We're not waiting on that final draft. And by the time there is a draft that kids are hanging together, the quality of it is much better. And they've had the opportunity to do micro rewriting all through the process. I kind of struggle a little bit when I work with teachers around the whole notion of the redo, which, which I think is fabulous. I totally endorse it, but it's hard if you're a high school teacher and you have 140 kids and grades due at a certain time, if you're waiting on an entire draft and allowing redos on an entire draft and kids can turn that in whenever, for the people that I support, that's a little bit hard to manage, you know, that kind of idea. But the notion of just write me the hook and I'm going to give you some feedback on it and then you're going to make the hook better and then I'm going to do a conventions lesson and you're going to polish that before we're moving deeper into the draft and committing even further. That that seems to be making a real difference for people. Yeah, Angelia, I mean, you're talking about like a constant ongoing um, yeah. Daily form, feedback. formative assessment where, where the learning is all right there and so there's no surprise on a summative. This is very conducive right. to say like elementary writers workshop where you have the kids for like a long period of time and you have the same class where the formative can always be there. What I was asking, I guess uh, maybe the question I want to ask uh, Trevor is more about documentation processes and how to design learning products where the formative is always self-evident. So you mentioned this idea of the podcast. Well, that's a great example where a lot of this production stuff could be happening where it's just going to be dead obvious if a kid is not up to par because they don't have their intro, you know, like they're, you know, something that's like a, an artifact you can go and listen to or, um, you know, that seems like it would take away any kind of notion of like rewrites or retakes of exams that we just stayed on our formative assessments and found ways to kind of keep those current as students move through a writing process so that we get to the end, this is what it is. You have your, your writing product. Any thoughts on that? So are you, are you, I guess I'm not totally clear on. Yeah, sorry, I was talking, I mentioned a lot of things there, but um, one is the idea of putting in the formative, but programming the formative in so that it is like a student blogging almost, like where uh, it, as you're, piece this part of the draft is already on the blog and so when you get to the next step or whatever you're trying to develop in their writing they're, they're just trying it out right there uh, and so the formatives like is an ever constant thing is that does yeah that make more sense? yeah no i do i do like that um I, that wasn't exactly how i um, i guess i guess i did something kind of similar as as kids wrote and um, I didn't have them make a script. I had them come up with uh, a sort of like sketch note graphic organizer of ideas that they talk about. And as they got to each episode, they'd have their book club meeting where they talked about, you know, their book and how what they want to talk about. And then they'd have to come up with like an episode pitch. So they would pitch the episode to me. So they would um, throughout the process as they were looking at their episodes, um, you know, they would pitch their episode to me. I'd give them ideas and feedback. Um, and kind of suggestions about things they could elaborate on or, or things that they could focus on. Um, and that, that summative wasn't just this random thing that I threw in at the end, but it was the culmination of all of the planning and prep work they had done leading up to the summative. Is that what you were? What you were? Yeah, no, I think that's what I was talking around. Having not taught high school English, then it, you know, it's a different, a different beast. I, I would often go up and talk to this guy, Jesse, at my last school and, and he was working in the same area where he's trying, he's, he puts in Boalian theater. I mean, the kids do um, participatory improv theater throughout their Shakespeare process. And so what the kids finish with is a final Shakespeare production, but they've worked through every element along the way. So it's not like go memorize your parts. Like it's all happening right mm -hmm. there in class and live time the whole time. And so he's able to kind of get in and create those formatives and do a lot of what you're doing of that front-loading, that's probably a better way to, of saying front-loading cognition, but that's the way I say it, of front-loading the cognition so when the kids sit down to write, they've already got their ideas spinning. Um, well, I will thank you. That blog post hit me like a sledgehammer. That was a beautiful <laughs> thing. I hope you keep up your blog. Uh, that was a great inspiration. Um, all this kind of documentation of your process as you go uh, I think that's a, a beautiful thing. You know, that's practicing basically what you're preaching of making your own thinking and learning process a visible thing right there on the blog. 
Um, yeah. Very cool. I, I appreciate uh, it. I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I would love to have you back on the podcast sometime in the future to talk more about your progress as you go. What year uh, teacher are you? How, how long have you been at this? So this is just my fifth year teaching. Um, so uh, it's it's exciting that, you know, even though I'm getting my fifth year, I'm still seeing all these avenues and uh, methods that I can apply and remix. And uh, I, I definitely will keep going with the blog. Um, and I, I'm glad that you found it useful and helpful. Um, and that it led to this, uh, this really interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah, cool. Angela, um, what are you working on next? Uh, what can we look forward to? Um, I'm your, doing more work around scaling print barriers and loose parts play um, and getting, I think, trying to establish more clarity around how I interpret Maker Ed and Writer's Workshop and um, doing some good stuff with documentation. So lots of learning this year. Cool. Well, we're going to disconnect here. If you guys would stay online just for a minute or so, uh, so we can say our goodbyes. But thank you guys for coming and packing all this into the last hour. Thanks for having us on. Thanks for having me.